I'm going to go ahead and introduce everybody and then uh, let each of you take a, a turn to um, introduce yourselves. So uh, remember the order. <laughs> Um, I'm the executive director of Warfighter Advance. Um, I'm a survivor of 22 years, two deployments, and uh, four and a half years away from my family uh, in support of this great country and in service in the military. I am very pleased to introduce uh, Lynn Cunningham, who's one of the co-directors and producers of Medicating Normal, Sergeant Angela Peacock, United States Army, retired, uh, Master Sergeant Troy Drasher, United States Air Force, retired, better known as the Shirt. Uh, Hospital Corpsman First Class, Fleet Marine Force, Tony Fuller, United States Navy, retired. And Logistics Specialist Second Class, John Scores, United States Navy, retired. So Lynn, I hand off to you. Um, hi everyone, it, is, it has been an honor, I've gotta to say, to make this film. Um, not just because I think that we are raising the issues that you've just seen in the film, which I think is really important, but uh, because of the heroes, in my opinion, that we have met along our journey. Um, I, uh, I just want to tell a quick story that five years ago, when we, in the research phase of the film, um, I was attending a conference about the ethics of psychiatry and psychology, and I, I thought that was a good place to begin, and I knew so little about um, this whole topic that when they when they released us on a, on a on a on a break we were allowed to go into small breakout groups and I had nowhere no idea where to go who the hot speakers were and so I just started opening doors and you know there were interesting things going on in every room and I would listen a little bit but one door that I opened um, I was so taken by a courageous, no-nonsense, straight-talking Navy commander um, named Dr. Mary Beaton uh, that I was gripped immediately. I sat down and I, um, was, I was blown away by her message and the uh, integrity that she had delivering her message and the dedication to, uh, in, in her field, raising awareness. Uh, that it was it was not long after that that she um, sent us an invitation and well it wasn't even a film yet um, but invited me down to one of the early warfighter advance um, rotations and again I learned so much there and um, met the most incredible people and I think it was a year or two later that we actually shot the, the scenes that you saw that are so valuable and so much a part of the film that I just want to say thank you Thank you, Mary, Doc V, and thank you, Warfighter Advance, for all that. Um, I, I want to be able to, I'm not going to be on this whole panel tonight, so I just want you all to know that if you do have questions about the making of the film or anything about the film, I, I'm happy to answer, and I'm so excited that, that you are all here having this conversation. It is why we made the film, so thank you very much. My name is Angie. I was in the film. Uh, it's now been four and a half years off of medications. I graduated with my master's in social work. Um, and now I help with outreach with the film and hosting conversations just like this one. All right. And the second one is uh, Shirt Drasher. My name is Troy. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, 22 year veteran, Air Force. I did 18 years as a weapons specialist loading munitions on V1 and F-16s. Spent last four, four and a half years or so of my, my career as a first sergeant. Total of eight deployments, about six and a half years I spent away from family. And uh, I just kind of got wrapped up into the, the meds and somehow with a really good stroke of luck, I found Warfighter Advance where they helped me. Uh, they gave me the information I needed uh, to help me get my feet up on the ground on the ground and that's what I'm doing right now just kind of helping the friends and spreading the word and making sure everybody uh, knows the harms of these drugs that we've, we've taken. All right and next up is HM1 FMF Tony Fuller. Good evening everybody yeah my name is uh, Tony. Uh, I am at 12 and a half years uh, medically retired uh, hospital corpsman petty officer first class. I went over to Iraq and Played for three combat tours and one sport tour, and also went over to Africa for a little while, almost all of it with the uh, Marines. Uh, two tours with the infantry, one with EOD, and two with uh, surgical units. Uh, 
shortly after retiring and starting to have some issues and my personal thoughts on medications and stuff, I had a friend who's a fellow combat vet in psych tech uh, introduce me to Warfighter Advance, and I was finally surprised because I'm like, wow, there's some people out here who actually get this. But glad to be here. All right, and last but not least, uh, LS2 John Scores. Right, so going, everybody. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm John. I uh, was in the Navy for 11 years, kind of all over, all over the place, medically retired in 2007, and uh, just kind of randomly ran into the Doc B at one point. I haven't looked back since. First, we'll start with a question for Lynn, um, which is, why did you make the film in the first place? What sparked the making of the film? Um. The film started out as a very, very personal mission to help a, a beloved struggling family member um, who had been a scholar athlete um, working in a high power job in, in Washington, was very um, ambitious, um, hit a bad patch and um, I remember our whole family it, at various points ended up talking to her doctors and what she was diagnosed with was a very severe mental illness. It was, um, we were told that she, if she, if she get on medication that she would be able to function and she would stay out of hospitals, but that the medication would, would be given for the rest of her life. And, um, this was, we accepted this just hook, line, and sinker. We didn't even know that there was any other option. And uh, these were all the best doctors we felt. And um, about 10 years later, she wasn't really getting any better. And, um, you know, she called me up every day on the phone, Linny, Linny, is everything going to be okay? And we have a very loving, tight knit family. And I would say, of course, we love you so much. We, you, you will always be taken care of you know, um, we will always provide for you. And at that point she was on disability and um, um, yeah, was unable to hold down the job. And I just kept thinking, why is, what's upsetting her? We're here for her until it just was like a, a, a light bulb that went off. And I, I realized it, she's not worried necessarily about her material needs. It was more her agency. Am I going to be the person I thought I was going to be. Am I going to be, she was a great, great writer. Am I going to be able to write again? And, you know, at the time on, on 10 meds a day, uh, she was unable to write, which was, which was the one thing that has given her such great joy in life. And at that point I realized, wow, I am not being honest. I do not know what's going on. And I need to start to do my own research, read. So I just start, started reading and one book led to another and it, and, and that began a journey. Um, one of the greatest books and, and, and Doc V I know gives you guys great reading, but one of the first books I read was the um, Anatomy of an Epidemic by Robert Whitaker, um, who is also one of my heroes in the film. And that book just blew me away. So yeah, it was, it was a, what became, it was, was a very personal thing, became a mission. Um, after I started learning things from people like uh, Robert Whitaker and Doc B. It just, so we knew we had to make a film and that's what happened. And there's actually another one here for you since you're just here in the beginning. Yeah. It says the film and Angie are both inspiring. It gives me hope. How can we get the film out for more viewings with COVID restrictions still in place? And I guess you could also talk about maybe the timeline of the film, what's coming up for the film. Yeah, so um, the film right now we're in the fa we, the, f the film festival phase was sort of not cut short because we ended up being in I think 12 festivals and uh, they all did a great job of becoming virtual, but um, we are now in, we, we've, we've just contracted with an international distributor to distribute a shorter version of the film. It's a 52 minute version. We are in the process of holding as many of these community screenings, which is what this is now, for as many people, as many groups who want to partner with us or, or anyone, two people we will film the screen for, I mean, mm. screen the film for, 
And um, we have a list of these screenings on our website. Angie and Nicole are our outreach um, directors and they're doing a great job of getting our film in, screened in many, many places. So please, please, we ask you guys, if you know a group of people who need to see this film to please, this is now, this is the time we are doing it. Uh, we will be um, uh, signing up with an educational distributor who will get the film into colleges and universities hopefully med schools. Um, but now is the time for our community screenings. And then I would say January, February, around that time, it will, again, hopefully be on um, Netflix or, a, a, you know, a, be able to be streamed. But right now, this is our community screening, mostly panel-driven phase of the film. But let us know if you want to see the film or if you have people you want us to show it to. So the next question is for um, Doc B and anyone else who wants to chime in. Um, what is post-traumatic stress and is it a disorder? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you my answer to that question. Um, post-traumatic stress is the label that is given specifically by psychiatry to what at Warfighter Advance we would call legitimate and natural human suffering. Um, and this human suffering frequently occurs um, after a human being experiences a traumatic event. Um, and what we, what we want people from um, the bottom of our hearts to understand that there is nothing disordered about legitimate human suffering. Um, and that what is in fact disordered is using this uh, legitimate human suffering uh, to profit. Um, and in my, my specific um, uh, concern is, of course, is profiting off of veterans, um, but of course, um, people suffer throughout the population, and um, there's basically nobody that the medical industrial complex will not go after um, in order to profit, and in specifically with um, pills and with other invasive treatments like ECT and ganglion blocks and all these different things that they use, um, and it. it as far as I'm concerned, delegitimizes their suffering. I don't know if any of the other warfighters want to add on to that. Yeah. Um, I like talking about this because I feel like looking back, my reaction to combat, war, whatever, the military, was completely normal. If I didn't react to that, then I would be concerned that something was going on, you know? So, um, but now the, the sad part is like, I would probably score with severe, chronic, persistent, whatever you want to, you know, all those, all that language and non-compliant on top of it, because I'm not going to take drugs for it anymore. But, um, but now I have medical trauma. Now I've been like traumatized by the mental health care system to believe myself to be disordered and to not think of myself as anything more than, you know, therapy appointments and psychiatry appointments and taking pills every day and thinking there's something wrong with me and to self-monitor for my symptoms 24 hours a day and always be telling someone about how anxious I am or how I didn't sleep last night or whatever. So I just want to stress that like that label came with a lot of, of course, access to healthcare, but also beliefs about myself that I'm still trying to untangle four and a half years after being off medication. And so it's not a benign thing to uh, be labeled with this thing that some of us see as a badge of honor to say like, I did something hard. I was in a combat zone. I saw great suffering. I need to be, you know, validated for that. But there's other ways to validate it rather than a DSM-5 diagnosis. What she said. <laughs> what do you guys think? Come on, John and Troy. You know, for me, post-traumatic stress, you know, and, and we're always correcting people, letting them know that it's not a disorder. I've had my eyes open that it's, it's, it's something that's across the board. I think a lot of people will associate that it's something that's in a combat zone. But it doesn't matter if it was a sexual assault. If it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter where the, the stress or the trauma came from. What, what it is is either in a single moment or several moments combined, our, how we looked at the world, our moral compass, everything was kind of upturned. Everything was turned over and the way we looked at things, were, it just, everything was out of sync. And, um, and it takes some time naturally to bring those things back, back together. You know, that's what post-traumatic stress really is to me is that it's, it, it's a process. 
and, and it's a journey. You brought up a good point there, Troy. It could be from anything. I mean, recently my wife and I were just in a head-on traffic collision at 50 miles an hour, and good three weeks, I didn't sleep. I didn't even want to get in the car. I was anxious and everything else, and I will bet body parts that if I went to see the head shed about it, I would have a new prescription that quick. But instead, just got up, got over it, and moved on. I mean, but it's just hilarious that with that one label, I mean, it just opens the doors to pharmaceutical bliss if you're not careful. Say one quick thing mm -hmm. um, that there we have gotten in the many, many different screenings we've had across the country. You know, why did you guys put in the same film the story of, you know, the military in with this general film about psychiatry? And it just made us scratch our heads because I think that the scene, the, the warfighter advanced scene, helps everyone. And, and all, of course, what Doc B says helps everyone understand what you just said, Tony, and that is you guys just have concentrated versions of stress because of Absolutely. your occupation and what you've been asked to do so valiantly by everyone in the country. And, uh, but that there are, there are versions of that everywhere we look. It's just the human condition. And, um, you know, just being born into um, an impoverished family, you're going to be experiencing versions of stress. And um, so I felt that, the, the, you know, the gem of our film was really putting um, Warfighter Advance and what was happening in the general world of the veterans side by side with the general population so that the two groups could understand each other um, better. So I think um, that on that topic, they, it, that it really worked for us that way. It says, first, great job on putting the film together and increasing the awareness of a very serious issue. Thank you for making me aware of the seriousness. I hope your movie is viewed by many. Warfighter Advance is doing great things. My question is for Doc V. In the movie, it mentioned that, quote, pharmaceuticals were the big giant in the room, end quote. It seems like psychiatrists are an even bigger threat since they prescribe the meds. If the medical community is responsible for the care of their patients over profit, what are psychiatrists doing to tackle the prescription concerns? Are psychiatrists aware of the threat of prescribing meds? So I, I, I think, um, I can't, obviously I can't answer for every psychiatrist. I think a lot of them are very aware um, and some of them are really not aware. Their education does not really entail a whole bunch of here's the harm. I, in, when I was in graduate school, I was, uh, took courses in psychopharmacology and it, none of it was ever mentioned. I, it, was, it was something that I had to go out and um, learn on my own. Um, and it was, uh, you know, in, in a nutshell, what made me start doing that research was that I was tired of going to my shipmates' funerals. And I just started to think, you know, what are we doing wrong here? There's got to be something, there's got to be something wrong. And when I started to, to research, I realized that what they taught me in graduate school was not um, anything but drug company propaganda. And, it, you know, looking like those little Zoloft commercials that you saw in the film, you know, with the little neurotransmitters going from the one cell to the other. And that's, you know, it, it, and it was just, you know, it was an, an amazing journey to, for me to learn that. And I, I don't know to what extent my um, colleagues um, have uh, educated themselves and, and, and understand that. Um, what I will say is that the, the person who wrote that question has a, has a, a great point because obviously psychiatry, um, the psychiatric nurse practitioners, the medical providers, they are the point of delivery of, of these very harmful drugs. And um, they need to know. If they don't know, they need to. They certainly need to educate themselves. Um, but the the ones who know, I mean, the bottom line is, if they know and they continue to do it, unlike the psychiatrists who are in this film, once you know that and you continue to do it, you're doing it to make your boat payments. It's what it boils down to. Um, you've got uh, bills to pay and a lifestyle to uphold, and that's what you're doing at the expense of. Uh, my brothers and sisters, um, and you know, I guess if that's okay with you, that's okay with you. It's not okay with me. Next question is um, for 
all the military panelists. What was your experience coming home from war? How was your mental health treatment? Did it help? And what do you wish were different? Anthony. <laughs> Oh, I figured you were going to jump on the hand grenade no, first. For you. <laughs> no, I mean, see, I was, I was actually more lucky than my peers here because I was a psych tech. And as Barry said, one of the things that medicine has done is very well train us on some of these medications. And being a psych tech in the Navy, one of the things they forced us to learn was classification of every drug we had side effects and effects that we were supposed to be looking for. So when I came back home and started seeing mental health, uh, immediately I was handed things off label. I was given propanolol, which is, uh, I believe, a beta blocker for high blood pressure to help with my startle response. And then it was uh, given trazodone, an antidepressant for sleep. And I was like, okay, I could jive with those. But the big thing got me is when they tried handing me Seroquel for sleep. And I'm like, why am I being given an antipsychotic to sleep? And that's kind of where the BS flag got thrown for me. And I just, I've never been one to take medication anyways. And I just stopped taking the medications. But I don't want to speak for everybody here, but I know I've been through three different military treatment facilities and three different VAs. And I can tell you, walking into any psychiatrist's office, the first thing you do when you tell them, I'm a combat veteran with PTSD, that script pad comes out before they even start taking notes. What medications you are on, what dosages, and what do you need? Um, I think, I mean, as you saw in the film, uh, that traumatic, last traumatic incident kind of happened where one of the, when our convoy got hit, when I was supposed to be on the convoy, the unit went to the range in the middle of Iraq. And... Um, after the soldier had told me the story of the trauma of him, you know, having shrapnel go through his back and he almost bled to death. And he said, like, I just want to go back there. And I got this stupid purple heart and I don't want it. And it was just all this emotion I felt building. Like it's too much for me to handle. I just came from a deployment. I thought I was going to die the whole time I was there, including my sickness. And then including, you know, the IEDs and the op tempo of the, of unit, you know, all that stuff. But looking back, I was like, you know, when I went to that first psychiatry appointment, I was like, I need help. I can't, I'm not seeing well to Germany. Like I, every time I hear the, you know, you heard that in the film, but um, looking back, I wish it would, you know, somebody would have been gentle with me and given me time off or, you know, let's take a month off. You're going to feel like crap for a while. You know, I think I say all this in the film, so I don't know why I'm repeating myself, but I can tell you that like trying to re, you know, heal from this trauma on top of a trauma, just from being treated and medicated for all these years. I mean, I've been given more than 45 psychiatric drugs in a 13 year period. I still suffer, you can't tell because I'm really good at acting normal, but I still suffer from like neurological effects from the long-term use of these drugs that I might not ever recover. I don't, who knows, you know? So um, just looking back, I see that one decision as completely life-changing. And I lost my career over that. I lost my marriage. I lost my femininity, my sexuality, my body. All these things are losses just from that decision to ask for help. Do you want to maybe talk a little bit about the med board process and how, uh, how easy it is for a, a warfighter to get sucked into that pipeline and pushed out against their will? Yeah, so... For me personally, when I went started, I was just looking for a little help. I was going through a lot of uh, stressful situations at the time. And uh, I literally just went in there. I'm like, I need a little help. I got another deployment coming up. I need something to help me, you know, get to that deployment because my focus was, you know, how, <laughs> how do I get through this? I know I'm, I know I'm having troubles. I know I've been having troubles for a while. Um, my command basically the doc told me that day, no, you're not going on deployment. Uh, you, we got to get you started on these drugs. And then within 48 hours, my command had uh, admin set paperwork ready for me to sign. And if I was a little younger and dumber, I, I would have signed it and then been out without any of the medical treatment part of it. Um, so for me, I, I, I probably, I mean, it, Warfighter Vance has shown me that a lot of people have similar experiences, but for a long time, I just fought through it and suffered in silence. 
Where I think it's John that has to leave shortly. No, um, who who had to leave? Anthony. Okay, so I'll ask a question, which is for everybody, and maybe you can go first, and then um, excuse yourself when you're finished. Um, what result from being involved with Warfighter do each of you feel is most important? Honestly, I think the biggest thing that I got out of Warfighter, and I know I've spoke to some friends who were also involved with the program that they got out of Warfighter Advance was probably the most important thing that they should have got the day they walked into a doctor's office, which is actual informed consent. I mean, I'm kind of in the minority with some folks around because I'm like, I don't think all drugs are bad. I don't think nobody should ever take a drug for anything. But I think if you're going to hand somebody a medication, you better tell them what it does and not hide the side effects of what it does. And again, like I said about how as veterans, we tend to always think that we're the problem to make people think that, you know, this is normal to make you feel this way. Oh, well, you're the problem. That's why you're getting more suicidal while you're taking 15, 20 times the recommended dose of X medication. And I think Warfighter Advance has really just given the gift of informed consent because I can tell you, it's known Mary for five years now. She has never once told anybody, stop taking your drugs. Try a different therapy. Oh, she's always just said, here's the information, and I think that's great. She, you leave Warfighter Advance with a backpack full of books, and you can now make your own decision because we're all big boys and girls, and we can do that in this world. And that's about it, folks. Have fun. John or Troy or Angie, do you want to answer that one too? Uh, I will, I guess. I don't know. For me, Warfighter Advance was kind of a reality check. Uh, when you're kind of struggling alone in the dark for so long, you start to not be able to recognize what's real and what's not. Uh, so a lot of that, like, anger and frustration that, like, why do I feel this way? What, you know, what, what's, it, it just gets turned in on yourself. And that was my experience. Uh, I was blown away the first time I heard that, like, it's illegal for your uh, military doctors to tell you to, like, to order you to take the, the psychiatric drugs, because that's exactly what they did. They said if I didn't, if I didn't take them as prescribed, that it would be disobeying a lawful order, and that would be all kinds of other issues. So just, like, meeting other people and realizing that, hey, I'm not like going through this alone. So I'm not the only person. So like I can start to recognize what's real and what's, you know, my negative mindset setting up and pretending to be real. Sure, do you want to answer anything? Yeah, what did I get from Warfighter? I got so much, I got 10,000 things. My wife, my children, my family could all, all name the several things that, that I, I got from it. A lot of parts of me back. Um, it definitely started with a single word. It started with hope. That was the first thing that I had when uh, it's, it's, an e it's easy for a lot of people to use the word hopeless, but to really know what that feels like and to be so lost in the world, so absolutely lost. First thing I got was hope. Met people that were just like me. I met people that were taking meds the same as mine, that were experiencing the the incredible depression or anxiety or the thoughts and the just the, and really the confusion of life trying to put everything together i was first given hope i was reminded of all the tools that uh, as a veteran i have my incredible skill at adapt adaptation all of our skills at that i was it was kind of like a, a buffet of all these tools spoken by veterans to veterans in a language that we understood and in a place that we really felt safe, many of us for the first time in a long, long, long time. In this beautiful group dynamic where 
you can see all of these things that are, are explained to us. It's, it's the knowledge. It's the little bit of understanding what happened to me or what is happening to me. Um, that informed consent of realizing, oh my goodness, all this information was there all this time. It was underneath my nose. I, I have these, these things that I can now start to try and put some order into my life. I have to adjust my priorities. I had to I had a vision and, and hope again to where once I get off of these things, hopefully my mind is going to start clearing up. I'm going to start thinking this fog that just does not lift. It did very slowly. October 10th coming up. Yeah. Coming up on two years since I took my last medication. And I have no idea, honestly, right now, as similar to some of you, maybe where are we exactly at in our journey? How much farther is it going to go? How much more of the capabilities that we had when we were younger, when, when our brains were operating at 100%, how much more of that are we going to get back? What handicaps do we have and what adaptations are we going to have to, to do to kind of work around things? It's, those are the things that I brought home from Warfighter that, that help us all, you know, with one day at a time, with intentional steps that we take and some of the hardest hardest honesty we've ever had to hear. And, and it's when we're talking to ourselves and, and looking at our life and what, what do we have to do to fix this? It, it's a journey. It's not about a destination. You know, uh, I'm a very goal oriented person, um, but I realized that it, it's okay to have that goal, but I need to be right here, right now, right in this moment, one day at a time. You know, like we hear those words mindful. Are you mindful, you know, mindfulness or whatever in all the, the counseling sessions that we've heard, but, but we were given these tools where now we actually were able to understand, this is what you're saying about being mindful. This is bringing ourselves in, into the moment. And I, I could think of a thousand things that I got from Warfighter and, and my, my family, the ones I, I care about and love, my friends, they, they could name thousands more, just as, as every day a little bit more of me comes back, but it's never going to be the me that I was. I'll never be the me from high school, from the military, from anything like that. But right now, 46 years old, here, you know, in my home, retired from the military. It's it's uh it's bringing me where I need to be. Okay, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so the next question is kind of two questions, sort of put together about. Um, solutions, I guess. Um, one of them is the military over prescribing drugs because they don't have the resources to properly help or is it because they don't know how to help? And the second part, if your message is to help people get off of meds, what actual treatments do you advocate for? Um, for those with, you know, different diagnoses, the one posed was ADHD, for example. So um, I, I'm going to be very uh, careful not to, you know, get into somebody's, um, you know, treatment situation. But what one of the things that we are very clear about um, at uh, Warfighter Advance, when we, we the lecture we do on informed consent um, takes six hours to present, and it's divided up, thank, thankfully, over a several days. But um, what one of the things I think they've pointed out in the film is you typically have an eight to 10 minute appointment. There's no way that anyone can ever give you informed consent in such a, uh, a small amount of time when I'm giving the minimum informed consent to the warfighters and it's taking six hours. But part of what we do in that um, six hour time frame is we talk about um, the nature of psychiatric diagnoses um, and we break down how uh, a, a part of the human condition becomes a psychiatric diagnosis, or diagnosis. And, um, and again, we send them home with the books so that they can read up on us and make sure that we're telling the truth about all this. So one of the things they learn, for example, is that whether it's post-traumatic stress or it's ADHD or it's anything else in that diagnostic manual, there is, there is no actual underlying medical condition. They're just aberrant behaviors or emotional experiences or things we don't like to see in a ch child, like being hyperactive. It makes them really hard. It makes it hard for them to behave in school or to conform to, um, you know, American ideals for children. So we we take that and we we label it 
um, voted into the book. You know, again, there's no other medical specialty where the, spe where the diagnoses are voted in and voted out. Psychiatry does that. Um, so we make sure that everybody understands that. And once you understand that there is no actual physical illness, it, it starts to immediately become illogical that you would, there, that there would be a medicine to cure the illness. It's, 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 a, it's a drug that is administered to try to push the person's behavior back into the, whatever the, the culture has decided is normal or just to shut them up you know, quick, keep, keep them from moving so much. Um, so anyway, that's a long way around to say that um, part of the solution is to, to stop asking that question. What treatment do people need when they come back from war? They don't need any treatment at all because they don't have an illness. They need support. They need love. They need, um, you know, other veterans to walk places with them. But um, when there's no illness, treatment becomes absurd. Um, and we don't offer any treatment at Warfighter. We um, don't have any mental health professionals doing any kind of treatment of any kind, um, and we get stunning results. So, um, you know, that, that speaks for, speak for themselves. Um, I don't have anything against someone going to see a therapist if they want to, um, but um, that's, it's, it's certainly not um, in any way necessary. I, I just, just to echo what she said, um, just community, we need other veterans. I know that I'm very connected to the veteran community, like locally in St. Louis and me being around other veterans, there's just this sense of, I don't have to explain myself. I don't have to tell them my history. I don't have to tell them my story. They get it. We can see, look each other in the eyes. We get it. I, I almost, I call it like a booster shot. Like I have to be around veterans so many times to get like a booster shot of like, you're fine. Everything's fine. What you went through is real. I mean, in, in being like a female combat vet on top of it, there's, it's so rare. I never get to be around other female combat vets. So when I am, it's like, oh my God, I'm like, I'm like a new person and I, I feel valued and validated and all that. So I think if anything, we need each other. We need, you know, when you go to ask for help, quote unquote, it's non-pathologizing, it's normalizing that you've been through something hard for you to have a reaction to that. Is exactly what should happen and it's not to say like when we say medicating normal like your PTSD is a normal reaction or whatever we're not saying that the suffering is not real because the suffering is real being up with no you know not being able to sleep and startle response and not being you know I still don't feel connected to like my family and friends and stuff like loving feelings and who knows which trauma that came from or the medication or whatever so the suffering is real but there's other ways to hold that suffering with your peers with people that care about you you know, with the chaplain, with other vets, you know, there's all these other ways rather than you're medically boarded, here's a paycheck, go home and get a new life and lose your identity. I mean, that's been more devastating than anything. I think I'll pose one more question and then we can sort of um, have closing remarks. Um, for the panelists, how did you guys find your peace when you had to bark at yourself? It's not me, it's the medication. How did you take yourselves out of those moments? I just know that I struggled with suicidal thoughts so severely coming off the drugs, but I knew that it wasn't me because I had all these reasons to be living, you know, and there was one warrior from Warfighter Advance in the film that says that, like, I don't want to die. Like, I, I can't understand why I'm suicidal. So, I mean, it's hard to distinguish that though. Like, do you, is it coming from the medication? Is it coming from you? Um, I know that I struggled with that for a good two years. And I, I'll tell you, it hurt me more than anything to watch like on Facebook, there's these 20 push up challenge or call the 1-800 number. And I'm like, meanwhile, I'm so suicidal. I can't even express or like to tell someone because that was how severely I was affected from the way that the doctors had taken me off the last drug that I was on that I couldn't even tell these people like, Hey, don't do this push up challenge. Come over here and help me. Like, I need you to get in the hole with me and like, I don't know, help somehow. It's like, I couldn't even articulate what I needed because I was so bad off. But I know for me, it was like a constant living in the moment. Like I used to count my heartbeats. Like this is not forever. This is temporary. This is not permanent. You know, I did all these things that I probably should have done before getting on the first medication in the first place. But there's tons of, you know, coping, talking about them with someone who's not going to call 911 on you. That was important to me. Finding people that, um, 
cared about me and that I could share things that were scary without them judging me. And that's a hard thing to find, but those good friends is kind of what helped me hang on. And, the, and sure enough, it did pass. Troy, do you have any comments? I mean, I'm, I'm still on my journey or whatever you want to call it. I'm still trying to find my peace sometimes. It's a lot of stuff that I've done that have helped, has helped. It's fairly recent. I was part of Warfighter Evolution 18. Uh, and it's been, it's been close to a year now, but it doesn't feel like that long. And uh, I still have to be aware. And I still have to keep my, uh, my thoughts sometimes very intentional. Um, but yeah, that, that piece is there all the time. Just get glimpses of it sometimes. Decide that that's what I want to work towards. Troy, do you have anything to add? Uh, sure, my, my piece, um, when I think about it, I, I didn't know what it was even gonna look like for the longest time. When I was in, in my hole and a bunch of vets jumped down in the hole with me and they, they helped show me the way out, I really didn't know what that piece could ever be. And it didn't, I had hope for it, but I really didn't know what it was going to, how it was going to come to fruition. Uh, in my journey, I, I'm, I used to live life with that three, five, 10 year plan that, and that brought me a lot of peace. It gave me focus. Now my peace is really just kind of uh, living in today, making sure that uh, where my heart is and what I'm doing, I'm comfortable with. I enjoy being a force multiplier for Warfighter Advance and, and helping to spread the word. Um, I definitely get my peace by sharing that. Might sound a little strange, but uh, I get my peace by helping my brothers and sisters. There's a, um, a story that some people might have heard about what it's like being a, a vet in a hole. I, I've heard it several different ways, but how it speaks to me is I, I believe that uh, you can get wrapped up in these meds and, and you can be down in your personal private hell. And it just keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And I, I believe that with good intentions, some doctors will walk by and that they'll listen to us. They'll maybe throw a script down in the hole. And, and, um, and there's some, then sometimes when you know, if, if we have faith to have a, a preacher, a priest, or minister, somebody in your church body, whatever, to come share some time with you and to, uh, you know, maybe throw a Bible down in your hole, say some prayers and, and family and support. And there's all these people around. But I, I didn't, we didn't have our peace when we were down in that hole. But what it really took was another veteran that to scare the heck out of me and jump right down in there in the hole with me. And to tell me, like, hey, it's okay. You know, they, they showed me through their actions that, that they knew the way out. And when I look around the program and I see all my brothers and sisters, the Alumni Warfighter Advance, and all the success that it is just blossoming, it, it's undeniable. Um, that brings me peace. It brings me peace to see my brothers and sisters um, jumping on the journey with me and uh, living for a better tomorrow. Okay, so um, just to wrap up, I wanted to say that there were so many comments in the chat and Q&A box um, thanking everybody for the film, um, for Warfighter, um, and for all of you panelists for being here today and sharing your stories and also for your service. So thank you. And now everyone can um, go around and say some closing thoughts and um, we'll wrap this panel up tonight. I'll just say for the film side, we have a YouTube channel with over a hundred outtakes from the film. Uh, panels just like this one, this panel will be up there probably by the end of the week after I get to editing it. 
We have a Facebook, Twitter, Instagram accounts where we put post articles about the subjects you kind of heard tonight, subjects in the film. So if you want to read articles daily, just follow us on one of those platforms. And if you're interested in hosting a screening or you know an organization that would like to, we'd love to do it with more military audiences. Please email us at medicatingnormal at gmail.com. John and Troy, what do you guys want to say? I don't have a whole lot. Just glad to be here. Glad to be helping. Um, as as Troy said, uh, force multiplier, warfighter events specifically has helped me a lot. Uh, uh, even though it makes me uncomfortable talk about this sort of thing, uh, if, if I could help one person by sharing my story, that's I, that's kind of the mindset I, a lot of people have with this program. It's uh, it's a big deal. So I just want to um, point out that we have a Facebook page as well um, and um, a public Facebook page. Uh, try to just kind of keep the community engaged in what we're doing and um, a little fundraising and that kind of stuff. We also have a website, warfighteradvance.org. Um, and some information about what we do on there, how to attend. Um, and I'm going to blatantly say that this program is free door to door to any um, warfighter in the United States that uh, registers. So whether they're coming from Buzzard's Breath, Montana, or across the street somewhere in Maryland, um, we, uh, we take over the entire cost. Um, and so um, if there's something that you feel like you can do to help us keep that free, um, please uh, hit that donate button on our <laughs> website and help us out or there's an address to send a check that would be great um, but we want to keep this free for our warfighters um, because it just means so much um, when when um, you know they're used to being as Angie pointed out um, put in a locked ward and have their clothes taken away and we say hey you know what um, we're gonna fly you out we're gonna pick you up we're gonna feed you food um, it's just a completely different experience for them because we're honoring them and are honoring their service on top of um, all that informed consent. Um, and the last thing I'm going to say, um, uh, just to underline what John Scores said about um, it's, it is actually not um, a lawful order to force a military member or a person at the VA to um, take a drug um, that they don't want to take. Um, the DOD instruction is 6,000.14. 6, um, look it up. It is not a lawful order. So thanks everybody for um, being here tonight. And thank you for having me as your moderator. And again, thank all of you for your service. And um, that's a wrap. Have a good night. night. Bye. -bye.